After listening to the few camping episodes from this channel, I knew that I needed to share my experience from my childhood. I hope you guys enjoy this weird memory of mine. Many years ago, our parents would take us on weekend camping trips in the summer and autumn. Generally, these were in the same area, which I remember as follows. We'd take a country road out of town for about 30 miles until it would intersect with a dirt road that very clearly went up a mountain. This whole area was ripe for various forms of outdoor activities like dirt biking, shooting, hiking, whatever a person might want to do. We'd follow this road up into the forest where other roads would splinter off to some other piece of nowhere. Well, if you followed that road deep enough, it would eventually come upon an old abandoned quarry. Nothing huge, but a couple of big blast holes and several pieces of piles of shattered granite. This was a neat old piece of history, and it gave my sister and I a cool place to play during those camping trips. For whatever reason, not many people went beyond this quarry. I think it had a lot of weekend visitors and believed it was still active, or maybe there was an industrial zone back there or something. Whatever the reason, once you passed through the quarry, it was nothing but open camping spaces. We would always choose the best one, the most flat one, and have that whole area to ourselves. This trip was no different than the others. It was all sunshine and smiles as we whirled through that familiar place, and then down the little sloped dirt road and into some rolling meadow. Grass, pine, and oak trees. Big fragmented boulders dotting throughout the area. We got a simple camp set up, just a tent and a table with four folding chairs. The fire pit that we were using had been dug by hand years before. It had a perfect ring of stones around it. Some were flat for warming coffee or even hot chocolate. It was an absolute blast. We drank soda and set the empty cans into the hillside, so we had something to safely plink at right there at camp. We brought BB guns and a 22 Marlin, so nothing too dangerous or even too loud. Dad liked to teach us how to handle a rifle and shoot. My sister and I absolutely loved it. Besides that, we would hike around and collect firewood and carve some of the most unique smaller pieces that we found into things like animals or ornaments. Sometimes even on lazy days, we just sit around camp and read while we listen to the natural world around us. Hands down, our favorite thing to do was walk over to the lake. Just around the bend from camp, the road would split into two. The secondary road came to a dead end at a big iron gate with a sign that said no access. This was the original road down to the lake that we would fish at, but had been closed off due to very limited parking, as well as other hazardous conditions. It was a half mile road at a pretty steep incline, all awash with gravel from the quarry. Instead of the state or forest service, or whoever was in charge of such things, made a secondary entrance way back in the 50s or 60s, which actually had a full parking lot and a much easier point of access. That meant the old forgotten about entrance on our side was never really used, just like the empty campgrounds for whatever reason, and people just stayed away from that end of the lake. It's like they didn't even know it existed. So my sister and I would pretty much have free reign to wherever we pleased, all because of the unpopulated nature of that area. If we wanted to walk down to the lake, we were free to do so without any adult supervision. Sometimes we'd be down there for hours and hours, skipping stones, casting lures, doing our best to trap crawdads and other fun lake creatures. If we went early enough, we would see deer and rabbits, maybe a fox or an eagle, if we were really lucky. That's exactly where this story takes a turn. That first morning wake up in camp, my sister and I had already planned to hike right down at sunrise and spend the whole morning pulling trout out of the water. We got dressed and got our equipment together, then walked shoulder to shoulder down that dusty road that would lead us to the big iron blockage gate. It was close to three quarters of a mile around the bend, and then another half mile down the hillside toward the lake. All in about 25 minute walk, maybe a little bit longer coming back because it was uphill. We wandered down that road for 10 or 15 minutes, and everything was right as rain. The same familiar ditches and trees. But as we got closer to that blockade, I saw something weird. I could see a car parked right in front of the gate. I guess this wasn't super uncommon, as some people did know about this access point. So I just chalked it up to some old timer who wanted to get his hours in before the lake would get too busy. 
we had a similar plan. As we got closer though, I could see people sitting in the front seat of that car. It was a chameleon of a car, and by that I mean it wasn't new, but it wasn't old. It wasn't nice, but it wasn't dingy. Nothing stood out about it. I'm not even sure if I can remember the color. It was definitely one of those types of vehicles that people would call nondescript. It had four doors, four tires, and was sitting with the engine off. By the time that we got close, I could see that the windows were down, and whoever was inside was talking back and forth in a bit of a whisper. Once we were totally inside, they hushed one another before the guy in the driver's seat leaned out the window. Good morning, kids, he shouted in this super jolly voice. It was disarming and put me at ease, as I could see the other person in the cab was a woman. Everything seemed pretty normal from a first glance perspective. Good morning, we said back in unison. I was carrying my rod and tackle box, so only my sister brought a hand up to wave. Isn't it a little early for you guys? Where are your parents at? He asked. Uh, they're back at camp, I said, nodding over my shoulder. They'll come after they make breakfast. Well, you be careful, the woman said from the passenger seat. It's a long way down. Thank you, we said again, in unison, before turning back to the dirt road. Again, none of this seemed too strange to a couple of kids. We figured that they were hikers or fishermen themselves, just being friendly. Hey, the guy said, which caused me to stop and turn around. At this point, I was mere inches from passing through the blockade. Yeah? Is that your sister? Yeah, I replied, starting to feel weird. Why do you ask? You better look out for the two of you. Never know what's out here in the woods, came his response. Then both he and that woman gave us the creepiest and scariest smiles we've ever seen. Ear to ear, super toothy, just unsettling in every sense of the word. They went from totally average to sinister in less than a second. Meanwhile, my little sister was just totally unaware. She was still walking down the road toward the lake. Okay, uh, thank you, I said. Then turned to follow her into the canyon. A seriously creepy vibe was starting to work itself into my brain. They hollered out a few more things at me, mostly stuff in languages like Bon Voyage and other stuff like that, similar to like movie quotes. The other strange thing that I noticed about them is that the couple was incredibly well-dressed. At the time, I would just say suit and dress, but looking back, it almost seemed like they were in formal wedding attire. A frilled linen dress, absolutely spotless, and the guy was wearing a pressed fitted tuxedo. We were every bit of 60 miles out in the middle of nowhere, it just didn't make any sense to me. I kept an ear behind us, as it'd be easy to tell if anyone was following us. The crunchy gravel would be a dead giveaway, and based on their clothes that they were wearing, I figured my sister and I would be able to ditch them in the woods pretty quickly if we needed to. Either way, no one came creeping after us, so by the time we could see the water reflecting through the trees, we'd all pretty much forgotten about them. We both raced down to the water, tied our hooks and bait on, then hurled our first cast out into the open water. It was a perfect morning, with blue skies, minimal clouds, and no pesky wind coming in to carry our cast back to shore. We set up the tackle box and got right to fishing. We did get a few bites, but ultimately decided to relocate. As the sun shifted in the sky, we became pretty exposed to the rays and wanted to find a little shade for the mid-morning. There was a little rock outcrop that cut into the water a good 10 or 15 feet, I'd say, but also had this little group of pine trees that grew over it, and it provided a little cover. We packed up and moved over to that rocky area. We had to move down shore, then hike up and around the west side for maybe a thousand feet, very close to our original fishing spot, but also more out in the open and visible. Being on that rock outcrop meant we also wouldn't be able to run away very fast if need be. It was a momentary lack of situational awareness, and in hindsight, we were like fish in a barrel just sitting out there in the shade. After getting a few bites, one of us actually got a fish on the line. I honestly can't remember which one it was, but we both stepped out into the water's edge to help reel the sucker in. 
It was a big trout, all chic and silver just underneath the surface. And after a few minutes, we hauled that thing up to shore and then threw it in the cooler. We cheered and started reattaching some bait, but my sister looked down and pointed at something in the water. It took me a moment to recognize it, but once I did, I was sure it was blood. Spilled down all the face of the rocks that we were on. There was a lot of gore caked and dried. It caught me off guard but didn't throw me into a panic. Seeing blood and guts along a fishing shore is pretty common. At that age, I'd learned to gut and clean my own fish, and I did so by the half dozen. I just figured some fishermen had a great fishing session and cleaned out his catch right there on the rocks. We kept fishing for a bit, but I was keeping an eye on the surrounding area now. The supreme silence had taken on a different feel, and the isolation kind of had me on edge. Still, I didn't panic and continued to enjoy our morning of fishing. My sister pointed out something a little later though. A shoe came floating by us, then another, both right there near the shore. They were dress shoes, looked very fancy, and one of them was stained with blood on the inside. I was reminded of the sharp dressed strangers up at the parking area. It had to belong to them, sure, but what about the blood? Neither of them looked injured when we saw them earlier and they probably weren't fishing, so whose was it? I looked at the dark streaks against the rock and we decided that we should probably leave soon. It was getting to be around lunchtime and I said that we should probably head back. The sun was high and shade was pretty much non-existent. My sister was pretty quick to agree and helped me pack up. All in all, we caught four or five trout, just enough for lunch back at camp. I was excited to be back with my parents and around our familiar camp. All that weird stuff down at the lake had just creeped me out. My sister got the poles secure while I packed up the tackle box. I briefly looked up at the hillside behind us. Up near the top, I could see a tarp all bunched up and partially folded into itself and of course, it looked like it was streaked with blood as well. That was it. I started hurrying my sister and we bolted off the rocks along the lakeside and then back to the shore, where the steep dirt trail would lead us back to the top. It was a decent little jaunt and took us around 20 minutes. My sister wanted to stop a couple of times to catch her breath, but I told her no. We were close to the top and needed to push through. In reality, I just wanted to keep moving, constantly looking over my shoulder for anything scary coming up behind us. All I could see was the lapping waves of the lake, glistening underneath the sun. When we got to the top, I saw that nondescript car was exactly where we left it, but there were no people inside now. This was a great sign for me, because I never wanted to see them again. All I could think about was getting my sister back to safety of the campsite. I don't know how to explain it other than everything felt sinister and weird, almost like a dream. Something just felt off. We didn't get more than 100 feet when I heard this short, sharp whistle. I whirled around, expecting to see my dad, only to see the well-dressed fellow from earlier that day. To my horror, I could see that he didn't have any shoes on now. He was standing maybe a hundred yards off, totally still amongst the trees. When we both turned around to look back at him, he brought up a single hand to wave to us. Hey kids, another voice spoke, a woman. Y'all catch anything? We couldn't see her, but judging by her voice, she was close. I quickly turned the other way, and sure enough, she was maybe 20 feet off the trail. Yeah, we caught, my sister started, but I quickly cut her off. She looked at me, and all it took was a look, and figured out what was going on. You guys left your shoes down there, I said, and took a step back, dragging my sister with my free hand. Go get them before they sink. Oh, y'all saw that? We didn't mean to leave such a mess, she explained. Behind us, I could hear the guy crossing over to us. When I turned to look, I found that he was already halfway over. I pushed my sister kind of hard, told her to go get mom and dad. She began to argue, but I yelled at her. I don't remember verbatim what I said, but it was loud and frantic enough that she dropped the poles and just bolted. My sister was young and small, 
She was unbelievably fast and used it straight to her advantage. It wasn't two seconds since she was 300 feet up that road and starting to turn the bend. I looked back to the strangers around me, expecting them to now be closing in, but I found the opposite. The guy was now frozen in place, and the woman was starting to move off back into the woods. I honestly figured that they were going to snatch me up and throw me in their car. I broke out of the spell that I was under and started to follow my sister, lightly jogging backwards with a tackle box rattling around my side. It ain't like that, boy. We're just having fun. I don't know why I said this, but I'll never forget it. Blood isn't fun, is what came out of my mouth. The creepy guy exchanged a look with the woman, and then they both did that same smile again. Yeah, it is, one of them said. I don't remember who. You just don't get it. Not yet. Another thing I'll never forget. It was like something you'd hear in a nightmare. Since they weren't chasing me, I turned around and started running normally, so I could create a little more distance between us. As I jogged along, I could hear them laughing behind me. Then I heard more sharp whistles again. It only made me run faster. So fast, in fact, that I actually caught up with my sister. I could see her knees and elbows pumping just a few hundred feet ahead of me. Beyond that, somewhere in the trees, lay our campsite. We made it back pretty much at the same time, spilled into a breathless heap, and started panic talking as fast as we could. Once they got us calmed down, we did a much better job of explaining what had just happened. Our parents took it very serious from the moment we showed up scared and running, but the lack of evidence that we had made them think that it was just some sort of misunderstanding. I mean, I told them about the blood, the shoes, everything, and my dad said that he'd go check it out. We sat with mom and ate breakfast while he wandered off back down that road, only to return 20 minutes later without seeing anyone. He said the car was still where it was, but no people were in it or around it. He said he would check the lake out later in the afternoon when we all went down to fish again. When we went, we didn't see anybody. That car still remained. We passed it and began the jaunt down the gravel trail to the lake, only to see someone coming up. It was a couple of old guys and a bunch of fishing gear, even had a pair of waders on. We all said hello and asked if they had any luck. They replied with yes, they've been fishing since this morning and were happy to be headed home. Is that your car up at the top? My dad asked them. It is, came the response. My dad looked at me and then had me explain what I'd seen earlier. He helped me with some of the details that they would want to know, like the fact that two strangers had gotten inside their car and were sitting in it that morning. The old men thought that was strange, but didn't know a couple that could be out here. They said they'd look around and maybe file a police report. My dad said he might do the same. They shook hands and we both continued on our own way. I have no idea what really happened that morning, but it had all the adults in the area on edge. It terrified my sister and I to our very core. She didn't really leave camp much after that morning, though we were only there for a day or two. We fished that afternoon and caught a few more. Never saw that weird couple again. Only the blood on the rocks. There was no sign of either the shoes or the tarp up on the hillside. It was almost like those creeps took my advice and cleaned up their mess. Either way, it's always been this strange memory that I've had. And I honestly would love some answers. Thanks for listening. When my wife and I first got married, she would drag me to these absolutely massive family reunions. They'd be way out in the middle of nowhere, typically on a dude ranch or a cabin rental type of setup. Then the excess would just bring a trailer or pitch a tent. This was the type of reunion where everyone would show up, even great grandma in the wheelchair. So being the new married in husband, I knew I needed to make an effort to attend. I was blown away by the first few times that I showed up and saw that turnout. The first day would probably see a hundred people. By day two, it would double that. Everyone asks if her family was Mormon or Mexican, and the answer is neither. Just good old southern breeding. One year, we had our gathering along a lake, 
that was off this beaten path. There were a small series of cabins, all rented for the family and already filled, so my wife and I had brought our camping gear and set up right off the lake shore. This was actually preferable to me as I'd been in a camper all my life, and this way I'd get to fish the lake at my own discretion. It also gave me a buffer between me and those 200 in-laws just wandering around the area. Also, along with my wife and I, was Seymour, our chocolate lab, and our son Jack, who was maybe around five years old at the time. After we set up, we made our usual rounds, hug Aunt Betsy, shake hands with Grandpa Dill, pester all the nieces, nephews, and cousins. I make it sound like attending these functions was a huge burden, but honestly, it was usually pretty fun, at least at first. Playing with the kids and the initial visiting, that always made for a good time. It was later on in the trip, maybe two or three days later, where everyone started to get unbearable. The kids were bored, they got loud and agitated, which agitated the adults. People began nagging each other, drinking too much, and soon an argument or something would take place. None of that had happened yet, so we were just enjoying what we could on day one. There were endless trails leading off into every direction, so I guided a few hikes through the area with my son and any of the cousins that wanted to tag along. It was fun, and after I got the idea of the area, I started taking them into more interesting terrain. We found a dry wash that had some good geodes in it, and a burrow underneath a tree where some animals had been sleeping, all kinds of bones scattered in the dirt. They looked to be cow or maybe some kind of small game, maybe a deer. Definitely not anything to be concerned about though. We made a big loop, so we just pressed through to one of the little thickets of trees and then picked back up on our original trail. As we moved into the foliage, I spotted a hunter's blind and froze for just a moment. Personally, I didn't have any experience with hunting, but I could see in the moment that there wasn't anybody inside that structure. I told the kids to hurry ahead of me and kneel down behind a big fallen tree. It was the only cover that I could see and I wanted them out of sight until I could investigate that hunter stand. I crept over to it as quietly as I could and saw that the zipper flap in the back was hanging open. The inside was clean, organized, and had a single stool set beside a window flap. No people, no shell casings, nothing at all. When I looked at the nylon, I could see that it was sun bleached and very weathered. That blind had definitely been out there for a couple of years. I gave the kids the all clear, and then we led them back to camp. Honestly, I didn't give it much further thought the rest of that hike. We were renting a piece of land out in the middle of the woods. If there was gonna be a hunter blind anywhere, it would definitely be out here in the wilderness. No harm, no foul, nothing to report inside my mind. I was just glad that it turned out to be not an issue and was happy to leave it behind. Again, this is all the first afternoon there. Fast forward a bit into the evening. Families have started to break off into their groups and settle in for the night. We were all hanging out with Uncle Pete and his kids, my wife's cousins. And that's when we heard that first long howl of a coyote. It sent all the kids into a scramble and all the adults kind of got a kick out of it. The howling was maybe a mile or two off. And even then, we had over a hundred people out here. Half of them were armed. A coyote pack would need to be rabid for us to be fearful of it. Still, the kiddos weren't aware of all of this, so a predator's howl throughout the night was pretty cool to them. They howled back, and throughout the evening, we could hear the pack triangulating through the hills in the area. One would howl north, two would respond south, and then the rest of the pack would all howl once, in between the north and the south lookouts. It was neat to listen to as we roasted out our hot dogs and tossed a big Caesar salad and enjoyed a firelight dinner with my family. After we got done eating and everything cleaned up, my wife and I put Jack to bed and snuggled the dog by the fire while our son snoozed away in the tent. This was always one of my favorite parts, just zoning out by the fire, holding hands, staring up into the starry night sky. The next day was more of the same as another 70 people showed up throughout the morning and started spreading out in the area. Day two had some pretty cool events because of the big turnout, something to keep everyone busy and distracted. The kids had a treasure hunt to kick the day off, followed by a three-legged race, some potato cannons, and butter churning contest, and a whittling class. This was another aspect of our family reunions that I liked. 
they really bred a connection between all the kids, and that showed them great lessons in life. By afternoon, though, you could feel the tension slowly coming out to meet the air. Kids complaining about it being too hot or too boring. There wasn't anything good to eat. No TV. This lent to little blow-ups between families and camps. Nothing major, just people getting irritable. I put it on my radar and just kept about my day. Jack and I went fishing. We played water fetch with Seymour and finished up a little sunset hike throughout the trees. My wife came for a little bit of it and spent most of her time with her family that she wouldn't see otherwise. By dinner time, we were back to our fire with some of us visiting aunts and cousins and having dinner back at our camp. We had this outlier spot right out in the water. So the back of our camp was just facing darkness as no one had put up a tent any further than that. I don't remember what we ate, but I remember the energy across the reunion space just being much louder than the night before. Singing, clapping, hollering, kids getting rowdy. Things settled as time went on though, and soon we were lounging and having some seconds as we listened to everything quieting down. We're talking about fishing when somebody pointed off behind me and asked who was out by the lake. I turned around to look and sure enough, there was someone out there in the dark, leaning on a tree by the shore. There was just enough light left that I could barely only make out their silhouette. They seemed to be average height, average build, just standing there, kind of swaying. We all kind of had a laugh and assumed it was a drunk cousin or uncle having a piss out from camp. I turned back to the fire so I could finish my dinner and just stay warm. A few minutes went by then 10 or 15, before someone brought up that the guy was still out there in the dark. I turned again, and this time as I looked at him, it almost felt like he was facing us, staring at our camp. I got this weird feeling and pulled Jack over to my side. That's when Seymour started to growl, hair on edge and everything. We had him leashed to a stake in the ground, but he was at the end of his rope pacing back and forth with his teeth bared out. Aunt Toddy said it was probably Luke, a 20-something year old cousin who had a bad habit of getting blackout drunk. She said he was probably lost and someone should go help him get back to camp before he falls down. Being the youngest male sitting by the fire pit, I was voluntold to go. I passed Jack to my wife and started the jaunt over to the stranger. I still had that weird feeling, but I tried to put it in the back of my mind. There was well over 200 relatives behind me, so anyone coming to mess with us would be totally outgunned. Having that many people around just put me at ease. But at the halfway mark, I remember that tree blind out there in the woods. I stopped short and slowed my pace a little because I realized I wasn't 100% who was really out here. What if that wasn't Luke, or any cousin for that matter? If it was some pissed off grifter in the woods, I sized up the person, who was now only 20 or 30 feet from me, tried to discern a little more detail. It was still too dark though. I reached into my pocket and produced a little pocket torch. I clicked the button and the beam reached out. I was shocked, not to see a man out there in the shadows, but a big black bear leaning up against a tree. It was staring directly at me, casually sniffing at the air. I know the black bears are on the smaller side of the species, but this one was a full six feet tall on its hind legs, easily several hundred pounds. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something like, oh shit. I started backing up, which made that bear curious. He dropped to the ground and started following me. Not good. I stopped and waited to see what he was going to do. Then the bear also stopped, but behind it, I could see the fuzzy back lumps of a baby bear cub crawling along. Bad to worse now. Hey! I hollered over my shoulder. Yeah? Someone hollered back. Bear! I screamed. What? Big bear! And with that, I turned and hustled back to camp. When I looked back, the animal had followed me a good 10 or 15 feet. Everyone at our camp stood and fanned out and started calling for others as a warning. Within 20 seconds, a whole wall of onlookers had formed, with a couple pistols and rifles for good measure. Where is it? 
Uncle Dill asked, around the butt of his cigarette. I clicked on the flashlight and exposed that big black bear in the dark. Everyone oohed and awed and started whispering amongst each other. Others openly said they wanted to shoot it, but Uncle Dill and the other old timers figured it really wasn't necessary. They had some of the teenagers and young adults put sticks in the fire, then wander around and wave them in the air, while yelling at the animal to go away. Between the smoke and ember and the shouting, the bears backed up into the wilderness and then disappeared. It was actually pretty cool to watch, but still, my wife and I were on high alert for the rest of the night, especially having a son and dog with us inside a tent. The family put up a little perimeter throughout the night just to make sure nothing bad happened if it came back. Nothing more did, but there was another spotting that night and multiple sightings the next day. Thankfully, it never attacked anyone, but all the cooking and commotion just kept all of its attention. I can't express to you the sheer dread that I felt as I walked out there towards certain death in the dark. Had I just taken the family's advice and wandered out there, it would have probably bit me around the neck and dragged me off before I could even scream. I have a lot of horrific thoughts about what could have happened that night. We finally got the scoop a year or two later. It turned out the family it had fallen onto to plan the whole thing went a little cheap. The camp and cabins they rented for us turned out to be seasonal bear hunting lodges and our family reunion unfortunately just happened to fall out of season. The price for the entire unit was super discounted because no one could do any hunting. We had no idea we were throwing a get together in the heart of bear country. I've been an avid hiker all of my life, and that's partially due to the area that I live in. When you live close to any part of the Appalachian Trail, generally that kind of lifestyle just bleeds into your everyday living. There aren't many of us between Georgia and Maine that haven't walked at least some part of it in their lifetime. I was doing my own solo hike in the spring in between the rains, but the trail had a little time to dry out. There weren't a ton of hikers that weekend, but there were a decent amount of people that were coming through for day hikes and some folks like me camping out on the trail. It was a mixed bag of people, but it meant there were always somebody nearby if you needed any help. This was day two of my trip, and I was planning on going for four total, and then my friend would pick me up at the appropriate trailhead and or parking lot. I had a backpack with everything that I would need to conquer my 25 miles of backcountry. On my second day, I came around a tree stand and discovered a couple of guys just milling around. I waved, they waved, and then we both kept on going. They looked like they were resting when I first spotted them, but now they were hiking steadily towards me in the opposite direction. This is commonplace on the trail, and I didn't give it much thought. This wasn't even the first group that I passed that morning. The trail is like a neighborhood when you're on it. When we got close, I said hello, asked where they were heading. They gave me this funny answer because the lookout that they mentioned wasn't in the direction that they were going. I mentioned this to them. They kind of laughed and said they were a little turned around. I told them that I was pretty experienced in this area of the trail and I could help them get back on course, to which they both accepted. Then they didn't really have any idea of where they were heading. They couldn't even tell me where they started. The more we talked, the more I realized these guys didn't seem interested in receiving any help. They kept dodging all my questions and talking in circles. It was weird. The next thing that I noticed was how clean both of these guys were. I asked them how long they'd been out there, to which they both gave two different answers. First guy says two days and the other guy said a week. Now I knew and had confirmation that something weird is going on. It's not uncommon to encounter drunks or hobos and tweakers out on the trail. I decided I couldn't help these guys and wish them luck on their hike. I said if they kept going the way that they were going, they would find people in a parking lot within 12 miles. They responded thank you and went on their way. I hiked without issue for the rest of that day until my feet started to ache a bit and the sun was going down. I decided it was a great time to break camp and set up for the night. Usually, I would set up the bare minimum, sometimes not even a fire, just take off and that would be much faster the next morning. Tonight, I chose to take my time and have a real place to relax. I found a fire pit off trail, 
got it up to snuff and then set everything up that I would need for dinner and the rest of that night. My little hideout was a few hundred feet off the trail, which is what the respectable folks do rather than camp right directly on the trail. It also lends a little privacy for those pesky bathroom moments. I got my dinner ready and started to graze when I noticed a big cliff face not too far behind me. It was rugged, steep, and would provide a beautiful view of the trail in both directions. I decided in the moment I wanted to crest it, just for a second, finish off my meal and see the fading sunset. It really wasn't too far off, but again, this was kind of out of routine for me. But I figured what the heck, why not? Well, it turned out to be the move that saved my ass. I got up to the top of this peak and put my back against the stone, eating my dinner and taking in that view, when something comes bumbling into view. There's just enough sunlight for me to make out two forms slinking through the trees, and from my position, it looks like those two clowns from earlier. Same clothes, same color patterns. What's really weird though, is they're hiking toward me, the opposite way from earlier, and they aren't on any trail. They're about 20 feet off to the side of it, bushwhacking and trying to remain unseen. Even their movements made it seem like they were trying to be sneaky. I'm finishing up my dinner, watching every step, deciding on what I need to do. Like I explained to you earlier, I know a lot about the trail life. There's a number of undesirable people lurking around every bend or campsite. Not everybody is up to no good, but man, when you find these people, you cannot create distance fast enough. Lots of thieves, lots of druggies, and lots of mentally unwell people. I've even heard of folks encountering wanted men that are out on the trail, out on the run. My first move was to get back to my camp, gently douse my fire, and make myself as invisible as I can be. Like I said, I was a decent distance from the trail, so if I was careful, I might be able to go undetected. I let the fire die after removing the wood, then went about securing all my belongings. It's not like I had a safe out there, so I just tucked everything into my backpack, fastened every strap and zipper, then actually zip-tied everything to a tree. I always carry zip ties. I used eight of them to fully fasten this thing, so no quick exit with it. At this point, the sun was gone. Twilight was giving up to the darkness. It wasn't too late yet, but the trail had me exhausted so sleep was the next thing on my mind. I nestled into my bedding with nothing but a flashlight and my trail knife, listening, waiting for somebody to come creeping up. Silence. All I could hear is the wind and insects coming to life. It wasn't long before I nodded off and fell fast asleep. I don't know when I woke up, but I knew why. The dreaded sound that I was waiting for earlier. Footsteps, crunching through the brush, and into my camp. I could tell they were pretty much on top of me, so I just laid still and silent and listened. They creeped past my fire, around my bedding, until they found my pack tied to that tree. The next thing that I hear is them trying to pick it up, bailing, and then someone messing with the zip ties. I sat bolt upright and started to yell for them to get the hell out of here. I thought that would scare them off, so it came as a huge surprise when one of these men jumped right on top of me. I was in shock, but at the same time, I had literally been preparing for this. Me and this guy start to wrestle, but he had the upper hand, as he literally gotten the jump on me. I struggled until I got out from underneath him, only for the other guy to shove me back to the ground. Not good, as the one versus one already wasn't going my way. I start to panic, so I tried to negotiate my way out of this. They didn't want to hear any of it, just jump back on top of me again. I'm not even sure what the hell they were trying to do. When that realization hit me, I just went berserk. It occurred to me that I could end up dead when all of this was over, so I did the only thing that I could do. I yanked my knife right out of its sheath, stabbed the guy closest to me right through the thigh. He was literally standing over me, so I just buried it to the hilt. He screamed and started freaking out, stepped back. I kept a firm grip and yanked the knife free when he stepped backward. It was definitely one of the most disgusting sensations that I've ever felt. His buddy came back over to help him just as I rolled to face him. All I could see of him was his boot, 
so I did the same thing and pegged that poor bastard to the floor. It plunged through the leather, the sock, and finally his foot before coming to the other side. Both of them ran off together into the woods, screaming at the top of their lungs. I started scrambling too, got my stuff together and ran the opposite direction. I knew there wouldn't be anyone hiking until dawn, so I just found a place to hide that was near the trail. The second the sun came up, I started bucking it back the way I came, hoping to find somebody normal. Sure enough, I encountered a few of them, but neither of them had a phone of any kind. It wasn't until I met up with a third or fourth person that I got my hands on a satellite phone and called out for help. I told them which lot I was heading to and the time that I would arrive. My lip was split and I thought I had a concussion from the fight the night prior. It was on and within a few hours I was rendezvous with a rescue team. They were beyond stoked that I was able to get myself to them. They loaded me up with the deputies and then took a statement from me. This is the craziest part of my story. Who do I run into at the hospital? You guessed it. Those assholes that tried to steal my pack. I caught sight of them and immediately told law enforcement, who detained them and started to ask questions. It turns out those men had been robbing folks on the trail for several months, and when the police went out to the car that they pulled in with, they found out that it was full with all kinds of hiking gear that didn't belong to either of them. It was a major break in a relatively large case in the area. I was medically cleared within 24 hours, but those guys were processed and booked after their injuries were treated. Beyond the charges and time served, no clue what happened to either of them. They could still be locked up for all I know. As for me, that attack and law process afterwards gave me a bit of PTSD. Found myself indoors for the better part of two years. Went to work and just hung out with friends, but I didn't go out of my way to spend even a minute outside now made me nervous. Thankfully, since then, I've returned to my old, normal self. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. That's my daughter screaming in the background. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, Feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Instagram or you can stalk me on X. All of these links are below. Howdy, partners. It's me, Sheriff Woody. Uh, hope you guys liked this episode. I uh, apologize about the stories for sleep episode yesterday. It was on my end. I don't know what the hell happened exactly, but it will be re-uploaded uh, more than likely tomorrow at some point. I don't know if I'm going to do a day release or probably a, a night release makes more sense. So tomorrow night, probably 7 p.m. CST like normally. Um, something like that. And it'll be almost like four and a half hours because for some reason the one I uploaded last night was only two and a half uh, and there's two hours missing. So I again, I don't know what the hell happened, but yeah be re-uploaded tomorrow night so those of you who enjoy those stories for sleep episodes can uh can uh, enjoy that outside of that i really don't have anything new um or anything i need to talk about so i'm gonna let you guys go have a great weekend and i will see you on tuesday or wednesday next week for cold case stories all right guys cheers <laughs>